Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on redefining productivity in the digital era. My name is Julia King. I'm a business and technology journalist and your moderator for today's discussion, which is the first of three webinars on this topic. Our next one will be on March 10th. With the unprecedented increase in remote and hybrid work, many organizations have realized they need to rethink uh, how they understand and how they measure productivity. At the same time, as COVID continues to disrupt all facets of our lives, worker burnout is at an all-time high. The great resignation is on. More and more employees are exiting the labor market. And increasingly, organizations across all industries find themselves at the crossroads of productivity and healthy worker well-being. Achieving genuine healthy productivity has become a critical business imperative. Whether teams are working in a traditional office setting from home or a hybrid combination, there's no substitute for having real data to understand worker well being, productivity, focus, burnout risk, and other key organizational health metrics. In this webinar, you'll gain insights into what healthy productivity is and why it is so top of mind today. You'll also learn how to use data insights to help boost employee empowerment and wellness, effective monitoring of improvement initiatives, and recognizing the potential cost of inaction. So let me get to our presenters. Today our presenters are Gabriella Malk, who is Vice President at ActiveTrack's Productivity Lab, a dedicated team focused on helping organizations transition to a productivity-oriented mindset. Gabriella joined ActiveTrack following a career focused on organizational effectiveness, leadership and design at management consulting firms including McKinsey and KPMG. She shifted from consulting into the corporate world when she sought opportunities to bring organizational strategy and solutions to life. Melissa Swift is US Transformation Leader at Mercer, a New York City-based consultancy. And Melissa is responsible for the firm's efforts in the areas of workforce transformation, HR transformation, HR digitization, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and workforce analytics. Her new book on more humanistic future of work, You Wouldn't Run a Machine This Way, I love that title, will be published by Wiley in January of 2023. Melissa is a recognized thought leader on the subject of the future of work post-COVID. She's been quoted on the subject in many major publications and news programs. Finally, we have Michael Schrage, who is visiting scholar, MIT Sloan Initiative on the Digital Economy. Michael has served as an advisor on innovation issues and investments to major firms, including Mars, Procter & Gamble, Google, Intel, NASDAQ, IBM, and Alcoa. He also has presented workshops uh, on design experimentation and innovation risk for businesses, organizations, and executive education programs worldwide. So at this point, I'll turn it over to you, Gabriella. Welcome. Thank you so much, Julia. I appreciate that. Let's, let's get into what we're going to talk about today and give a brief uh, overview of the agenda. First, we'll talk about the emergence of the new productivity. Second, we'll shift into ongoing workplace measurement after defining what that new productivity is. And then finally, we'll have a conversation about how we can elevate sustainable productivity in our workplace. When we think about employees today, we recognize that employees' needs are stronger than ever. And companies that don't act on this are putting performance at risk. We know that we've, we've addressed and embraced and addressed these key themes such as talent acquisition challenges, retention strat, uh, strategies and challenges and turnover. Mental health and well-being is top of mind with employees explaining to their managers, their leadership and their leadership that they need more levels of support around how they can establish better types of work-life balance today. Hybrid work challenges are among us as we think about whether or not we're bringing our employees back to the work to the workplace or whether we'll be shifting to more permanent hybrid and remote strategies. 
collaboration fatigue is before us as we think about the amount of time that we spend in collaboration applications, whether that be messaging on tools like Teams and Slack, or that be on camera meetings such as Zoom or GoToMeeting, where we're spending the majority of our time behind the screen as a means to collaborate. The Productivity Lab discovered in just this, its most recent workplace study that employees are spending 2.4 hours a day in these collaboration tools. Nearly one third of the workplace is experiencing a level of burnout in some capacity in terms of being overutilized. Now we know that these issues are prevalent and we know that these issues are top of mind, but how we're all handling these issues is a little bit of is what a little bit of what we want to talk about today. So Gabriella, at this point I'm curious, are these new topics or just topics that we're now paying attention to? It's a great question, Julia. I would say that these topics are certainly not new topics. I would even say that these aren't topics that we're only just starting to pay attention to. What I would say is that the risks that they pose on our business are at an all-time high. The size of the groups that are experiencing these pain points are bigger than ever. And so when we think about the type of solutions that we bring to the workplace to address these pain points, we have to think about those solutions a little bit differently. The size and the magnitude of the problem has changed in shape. And so therefore what was working in the past might not necessarily work in the future. Hmm. Well, let me pull Melissa in for a minute. Melissa, what are some of the progressive ways companies are prioritizing these issues uh, alongside their everyday business goals and objectives? Yeah, no, it's an, it's an interesting one because I think part of what's happened is we've really opened up the chessboard, right? So you know, as a, as a, for instance, a lot of things that we've taken for granted for centuries, like the five day work week, you know, we see organizations saying, you know, let's, let's try a four day work week. We see a few uh, high profile tech companies trying that out right now. Um, and, you know, that's, that's some of the bolder moves, some of the, you know, kind of smaller moves that play with the same variable, that variable being, you know, time in that instance, are you know, or things like, should we have 25 minute meetings instead of 30 minute meetings and 50 minute meetings instead of hour long meetings? And that one resonates for me because I've always said, just like in high school, when you had 10 minutes to change classes, you need the same thing at work. So I think we're, we're seeing some interesting strategies to kind of, again, you know, can we stack the same building blocks really differently? And that's, that's exciting. Julia, before we do the poll, I just want to make a comment on, on what Melissa and, and Gabriella have said, and we can let people look at this. But I just want to take one small issue with what, uh, with, with what Melissa said, which is I don't think we have strategies. I think we have a set of tactics. We've aggregated them and we call them a strategy. And I think one of the most important things that we should be coming away with from this webinar is the notion of what's a tactic to manage a pain point versus what's a strategy to address the larger issue of balancing productivity and, and wellness. And I think that's why this particular question you have coming up is so appropriate, because we can't have a strategy until we identify more clearly the priorities of the problem. Michael, you make a terrific point there. So let, let's go and get some answer to this first question, some answers to this first question. What is your organization's most challenging workforce issue? Turnover, burnout, engagement, well-being, hiring and and michael i'll ask you what are your suspicions as we wait for the results what are you expecting to see here i don't know who's on the call i don't know who's on the webinar so the honest answer is i haven't a clue my here's my bet as people answer this my bet is that we're going to have a distribution of answers i will be surprised if one or two are the spike i think it's going to be balanced that said, I look forward to being proven wrong or proven right. Either way, we're going to discover something important. What do you think of these? I'm not wrong, he says selfishly. <laughs> these don't surprise me either. I mean, we, as, as we teed it up at the beginning here in this conversation, all of these issues are top of mind for us. The, the distribution across the five of these key topics are, are you know, only further uh, or make that case, right? We are experiencing turnouts or turnover. We are experiencing burnout. We are experiencing engagement issues. 
The truth is these topics are all inextricably linked. When we lose the engagement of our workforce, when we disregard their well-being, when we allow burnout to take hold, turnover happens, right? And so what I would what I would guess is that to some degree what you're experiencing right now might be where you are in the journey, right? Because I think that if you're experiencing those engagement and those well-being issues, we know that if those go neglected, that burnout is on the horizon, and that if burnout goes neglected, then then so comes turnover, right? And so I think this is this is certainly an, an interesting distribution, uh, but I would echo Michael on that it's not all all that surprising. Before Melissa chimes in, I do want to make what I consider to be a, a I, I find the, this distribution quite interesting, and I want to point out something that's obvious. Here we have burnout number one. You would think that well-being is a leading indicator of burnout. So it just shows you that this is where you have the conflation between tactics and strategy. If you're managing well-being better, you're not going to have the same level of burnout. I am a little surprised how tightly coupled burnout and engagement is on this. Clearly, organizations are concerned, and we, we should discuss what that, that means. And I'm very interested in Melissa's view on, on, on this as well. But, but clearly, well-being as a leading indicator is being subordinated, and the notion of what is healthy engagement and what is bad burnout, those are the two top of mind, forgive the phrase, burning platform issues. Do you see this, Melissa, or not so much? For me, I think what's interesting is what sits behind this in terms of, you know, we've been looking at workers kind of at, at Mercer in two camps, the burnt out and the fed up. And burnt out is, you know, I am simply working too many hours, you know, and that's what we're seeing across, you know, let's say financial services, tech, a lot of white collar knowledge work. Fed up is I had structural issues with my job that long predated the pandemic. And they are coming to the fore now as, you know, ev everyone's work has intensified, but they were always there. So, you know, healthcare would be an example of that. A lot of blue collar work had, you know, kind of long-term work intensification issues. So my question kind of looking at this data is to what extent is the sort of burnt out versus fed up, you know, motivating uh, some of these pieces, right? So when we see turnover, right? How much of that is burnt out? How much of that is fed up? Same thing with engagement. And I think it's an, it's an interesting open question and every you know job, every role, every industry can have a version of both. But I, I do think it's a worthwhile kind of area for exploration and, and diagnosis. To what extent are people reacting to the intensity of the last few years versus deeper structural issues? I, I think that's a brilliant insight, just a quick comment, that the whole notion of segmenting or classifying engagement around a uh, burnt out versus fed up dichotomy. That's really interesting. Just to have that kind of a conversation in an organization is going to be productive, pun intended. Well, let's go to our next poll question and we'll get a sense of how, um, how the audience um, tells us what is your organization's most, or I'm sorry, how has the pandemic impacted your organization's productivity? Uh, substantial improvement, modest improvement, stayed the same, dipped, drastic decline. This is really an important question, and I, I'd love all of our panelists to tell us how, how would y'all describe productivity changes over the last two years that, that you've seen? I mean, we certainly are living in unique times here. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the first step at that one, Julia. I, I find this question to be fascinating because we've all read a myriad of headlines uh, across the past two years that have told us that productivity has gone up, stayed the same, gone down. And so I think what it comes down to and what it's begged the question for me is, well, how many different ways are we defining productivity? You know, what is productivity? And if we're not all defining it in the same way, have we allowed ourselves to, to, to subscribe to a story, uh, a storyline in which we're comparing totally different things from one organization to the next? So uh, I'm curious to see how this one unf unfolds in the poll, because I think it's indicative, as Michael said, is, is kind of the different organizations that are represented here in the audience and how, you, how you've gone about defining productivity. Wow. Wow. Well, I think this one highlights Michael's reaction. <laughs> I would say that that mine uh, again 
uh, not wildly surprised, but I think that this leads us into, into a great discussion for, for the rest of this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're located. Uh, I, I think for me, it, this is in keeping with a lot of the headlines that we've seen, right? We've heard a lot of, uh, of talk about how productivity over the last two years has managed to stay the same or increase. And that's certainly the case for the majority of you here in, in the audience. Um, so, so again, not wildly surprised, but I think it leaves us much to talk about as we continue. But Gabrielle, I can't help but notice, you know, this is literally over half of the people, it's the same or more, and their big issue is burnout and engagement. You'll forgive me for observing that, that um, I'll use the S word, this kind of thing doesn't look sustainable to me if you have these kinds of burnout and engagement issues with substantial improvement, modest improvement, and stayed the same. I do hope that we get questions and comments from the folks who experience dips and declines, because I'd like us to discuss to what extent that's related to the issues that Melissa identified, fed up or burned out, or, or bad management. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say as a, a student of history on these things, um, it looks in some ways that you could say this is very similar to certain phases of the industrial revolution, right. right? Getting a lot done and just churning through human beings at the same time. And we're experiencing the consequences of that now, right, Melissa? I mean, and, and, and everyone, I think that that is, that is the turnover and the burnout that we're seeing. Let's keep going because I think that this is a great segue into the conflict that, that we've identified for today's conversation. Here's the conflict that we see. We see uh, exactly what you, what you all have shared, right, in the polls here. Productivity has managed to stay the same or was better throughout the pandemic. We are hearing that often and frequently. What we also hear is that burnout is at an all-time high, employees face Zoom fatigue, technology disruptions are hindering our employees' ability to focus, and that we're amidst a, a great resignation. And so what we are putting forth here is that when we're separating the two metrics, it allows us to report the good in one spot while neglecting the challenges in the other. What this brings us to is this need that businesses must modify their definition of productivity. And so if you look on the left-hand side here, so sort of a, 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 um, a reflection of the previous one, we see positive reporting on productivity and negative reporting on employee wellness and these topics that, that are top of mind for us. What that means is that we need to start introducing a new type of productivity, a productivity that is sustainable. And so when we think about sustainable productivity, we think about it in a way in which we measure productivity by healthy workplace and workforce inputs and healthy business outputs. And so what that means, and we'll talk about it as we continue to go through today's discussion, is that we no longer can separate these two topics. We now need to bring them together and measure them in similar ways so that we can more appropriately evaluate the productivity in our workplace. What we know is that metrics must change to measure sustainable productivity. When we look on the right-hand side here, we have been measuring our outputs for years, right? And so Melissa sort of tied us back to, to the industrial era in which we have become very, very uh, proficient in measuring output, whether that be through sales or inventory, or customer satisfaction. We've adopted these real-time ongoing synchronous metrics. Now, if you think about the other side of this equation, when we start redefining productivity into one that is more sustainable, you think about the way that we've measured the inputs. Now, this is not to say that we haven't measured the inputs. In fact, I'm sure a lot of your organizations today use metrics such as attendance and employee feedback, engagement survey, training completion, benefits data. All of these data points give us information about our workforce and our workplace. 
Now, my issue with these metrics today is that they are oftentimes self-reported. They neglect to uh, capture the feedback of the entire organization, and the metrics are asynchronous. They're captured in a single point in time and, and perhaps over a consistent basis, but not a frequent one. So if you take the engagement survey, for example, you're collecting that feedback you know, potentially once, two times a year. For those of you who are who have a, who have who are um, thinking about this more on a frequent basis, you might be doing pulse surveys on a monthly basis. But the the issue still sits, which is that while we have ongoing and detailed metrics on the right hand side, we neglect those ongoing and detailed metrics on the left hand side here when we think about inputs. And so what we want to talk about today is the fact that you cannot adequately measure without a level of ongoing metrics on both sides. So let me pause here, Julia. I'd love for you to engage both Michael and, and Melissa here with some questions in terms of how they react to this and of course, how other organizations are grappling with this today. Yes, sir. I'm curious, what, what implications do you see in, in the scales being tipped like this? Or is this a, 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 a tactical or a strategic change that you see, Michael and Melissa? Well, I think one one interesting um, trend we're seeing, and you know, this is a very you know kind of more more cutting edge way of of looking at things, is trying to really align you know sort of the best real time data you can get, so more of that real time employee listening, um, with some of those outcomes on the right hand side, and can you actually model business impact uh, around some of these people metrics. Um, that, that, to my mind, is, is some of the most interesting um, and impactful work that we're seeing organizations do is, you know, for too long, it's kind of been two different camps of people looking at two different kinds of data. If you think about who looks at sales data or inventory data versus who looks at engagement survey data, it's literally two different groups of people in organizations that don't talk to each other. And so the idea that you can bring those groups together around business impact modeling, I think is a really provocative and interesting one because the, the future is that we can't have just human resources looking at people data. People data should matter to everybody and it should be reconciled with other data sets. So that's, that's a bit of kind of where the future is going. Are most organizations doing that today? Not yet. I'll, I'll just chip in and uh, uh, violently agree with what Melissa has just said, but but also be less polite than she was and say it's ridiculous to believe that productivity isn't is the responsibility of the finance, marketing, sales, line people, and wellness is the responsibility of personnel, HR, etc. That's rubbish. That's nonsense. It's literally not sustainable from the own from the very polls that we have seen here. That said, that said, it is not clear to me, and this is what I'm hoping we will discuss, and, and I'm, I'm hoping Gabriella can share some of her examples. When do organizations come to the realization that they have to measure differently to balance the stresses they put on and the demands they make on their people with the outcomes they want for their investors and their customers? Can you give us an example of that, Gabriella? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the piece here that, that both Melissa and Michael are touching upon is the fact that this data ultimately gets, can be, it should be in the hands of the all of the organization's leaders, managers, and employees. There's a level of ownership that needs to happen across the organization. No, no, no. You're, you're giving me the high level thing, Gabriella. Give us a client that did this. So where I'm going with this is with this specific example, Michael. So what I'm what I'm sharing is that when we think about sharing this at all levels of the organization, we think about how this can be effective. So if you take the example of a finance customer that we have here located in located in Delaware with a with a burning question, which is how to help their employees shift to a remote working environment. They were eager to acknowledge that their employees were asking to shift into a remote work setup, but they also were treading lightly to make sure that, that the change that they were in, implementing in their workplace wasn't going to impact their business outcomes. And so what this organization did is that it made sure that when it used a level of ongoing measurement on the left-hand side, 
they were able to introduce a level of trust and transparency with their workforce by communicating to them that they were going to measure ongoing activity to better inform how they could provide support in, an, in a workplace that no longer was visible to them, right? And so what this organization did is that they communicated early and often about the purpose of collecting data like this, explaining that they were now chasing sustainable productivity and not merely productivity measured by outcomes. In communicating that message to their workforce, they continued the education process. They made sure that they were clear on what they were measuring and what data they were capturing. And they did this by actually putting that data right in the hands of their employees. They said, hey, we want you to also be aware of your workplace habits so that together we can come up with solutions that support a remote workplace that's no longer representative of our in-office workplace. So I just so want to, want to highlight say. one second, Michael. Yeah. What I want to highlight here in this in this explanation and in this storyline is that what this customer did is that they involved their employees in the conversation and they involved them in the in the redefinition of the new metric. And I just want to yeah. okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. That you're saying, Gabriella, this is not just a tool for managers to oversee employees. The sharing was done. There was symmetry in the sharing between what the manager saw and what the employee saw. So this, this was not just a better management tool, this was a better tool for employee situational awareness. Am I putting words in your mouth or is that a fair characterization? No, in this case, it becomes more of an employee empowerment solution than it does a manager tool, Michael. Excellent. Well, Gabrielle, you also mentioned communication more than a few times in, in your last uh, explanation on, on this slide. And I'm curious about, you know, Michael talked about sort of the siloed nature of measuring productivity and measuring um, worker well-being. How is that communication handled? Sure. So one of the things that I want to talk about is communication and, and it in its different facets, right? We can talk about communication in terms of telling your employees that you're going to start using a level of ongoing measurement to chase sustainable productivity. That is sort of a, a, a um, that's a communication about what's coming. There's also a level of education that needs to happen that comes with that communication. And that education is the why we're doing it, the how we're doing it, and what the value is for, for what we're doing. And then the final piece of communication that is most essential is the communication around the actions you are going to take with the insights that you glean. And so if you don't take action and communicate those actions to your workforce, then the value of why you collected the ongoing measurement becomes for naught, right? And so the communication piece it goes hand in hand with the actions, of course, that need to be taken but that is the most essential component to partaking in any level of ongoing measurement. If you do that, you have to deliver on the value back to the employees. Mm -hmm. Understood. Well, well, let's get a sense of how our audience is handling uh, the collection of, of workplace and workforce data today. Can we move to the third poll? How does your organization collect ongoing workplace and workforce data? Aggregate activity data for well-being insights, we use weekly employee pulse surveys. We rely on daily feedback via formal and informal conversations. I'm not sure. Uh, again, I'll ask our, our, our presenters to give me a sense of what you expect to see here. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I think you know what you often see is kind of a, a tale of two data sets. So organizations are great about you know 30,000 foot, let's do our employee surveys, let's collect at the high level. And you know, oftentimes you have decently skilled managers at the front line who are having those you know day-to-day one-to-ones. What you don't see is the aggregation of the kind of like frontline worker on the ground experience across those one-on-one -on -one conversations because they're one-on-ones. -on -one. So that doesn't get aggregated and fed back up. And also, there's not a lot of reconciliation between again that informal grassroots level of conversation and then the high-level engagement survey work that's done. Like maybe you'll get an anecdotal discussion of, well, you know, in this conversation I had with Bob the other day, it really came through why our engagement scores are this. But 
you know, it's pretty mechanical, it's anecdotal, and it's just, it, it's not programmatic. So, you know, it's, it's really uh, both, I think, a kind of a data management and a data analytics challenge in that way. We have 38% I'm not sure, which is telling in and of itself in terms of that data being collected. And Gabrielle, I think this conveniently leads you to your next point here with the ongoing workplace measurement. Yes, so let's let's put these in the back of our mind and, and keep these, Michael. Let's talk a little bit about these as we keep going. I, my immediate reaction to that was, I, to be honest, quite surprised in terms of the, the types of measurement that are taking place in the workplace today because a lot of that, I'm, I'm not sure in formal conversations is one that I would necessarily even categorize as a, as a type of measurement, right? And so what I want to talk about today is the need for a level of ongoing measurement on workplace inputs to ensure that you can start driving sustainable productivity. When we start looking at employee activity on an ongoing basis, we are able to understand those employees that are at high risk of burnout. We're able to understand employees that are high risk of disengagement. Now, I didn't modify this, right? This is, these are, these are sort of the first, first two bullets that conveniently align with exactly what our poll results said at the beginning of this session. We are experiencing employees in our workplace that are a high risk of burnout and are high risk of disengagement. And what we are finding is that we're not using the measurement that we need to identify those individuals before they are at that high level of risk. And so when we use ongoing measurement and we are not relying on surveys or feedback at moments in time, we're able to address disengagement and burnout. We're able to address workload balance issues in which perhaps we have work that can be shifted from one team to the next to ensure that, that we are mitigating sort of overwork and overutilization. We are also able to understand process improvement opportunities and technology optimization opportunities. So one of the things that Melissa said here in conversation was that this type of data isn't only advantageous to a single function. This isn't just HR data. This is data that becomes a, a must-have sort of uh, insight into understanding not only how your people can can contribute to your workplace productivity and your business outcomes, but how your technology and your processes can be optimized and, and improved upon as well. And so what we're saying here is that ongoing measurement is for the benefit of the workplace and it is a good thing. What we're also saying here is that is it is an ethical thing in that we can no longer turn a blind eye to these needs of our employees and these needs of our workplace. We have to take those insights and we need to take action on them. Thoughts here, Michael, Melissa? Yeah, I'll just chime in on the, the ethics point because I think it's a wonderful one um, that a lot of our, you know, kind of, um, assumptions about work have been really, I think, ethically flawed for, for centuries. And, you know, this, this idea that you need to kind of willfully turn a blind eye to the sort of some of the more basic human needs of folks, you know, in the, in the workforce is, is a flawed one. And I think that's, it's a, one of the, you know, silver linings of the pandemic is really thinking about, okay, if I'm an employer, I do have to think about these these wellness needs and on more of an ecosystem basis too. So it's it's everything from you know do folks have the right benefits to you know are they doing work that is fundamentally impacting their wellness or are they doing work in a way that is fundamentally impacting their wellness that it's sort of it, it's not optional anymore to say, as long as things get done and numbers keep rising on spreadsheets, it's all gonna be okay. I mean, I'll come back to the word from earlier in the webinar, sustainable. That notion of what it means to make work sustainable is really you know, kind of gaining amplitude in the conversation. And I think it's an encouraging development. My, my very quick response is to go back to, to uh, Gabriela's Delaware story, which is, I think it's only the ethical thing to do if people are aware, to use a medical phrase, given that we're in a pandemic, that there's informed consent 
by workers in this regard. And this strikes me as one of the most important issues that I hope we will be discussing in the Q&A session, but I think this is, strikes me as one of the most important issues regarding measurement, which is, and it's why I asked the question about empowering managers versus empowering employees. The ethical thing to do is to give people information that puts them in a better position to make decisions in their own self-interest. If that is not the situation, then it is not ethical. To me, we are hurting ourselves, literally and figuratively, if we do not gather and share useful and usable information, not just about productivity, but about employee wellness and managerial wellness. Well, we do have many, many questions lining up in the queue here. So Gabrielle, I'm gonna ask you to move ahead and, and talk about a model for good measurement. Sure, when we think about uh, good measurement, Julia, we really think about it in, in terms of three pillars that are essential to making sure that organizations can do this and they can do this well. We think about trust, which stands at the top and stands at the top for a reason, because we know that organization organizations' cultures must be built on trust. And that's a, that's a two-way mechanism that exists in which leaders are able to trust employees to fulfill their role, and employers are able to provide the support to the employees that they need to do that. Empowerment is the second staple for a model for good measurement. Empowerment of managers and employees to achieve outcomes and manage their time and surface their needs when necessary. This speaks to the need for a level of self-advocacy uh, and, and a level in which we empower the individual to raise their hand when they need help. But it also means that we empower them to do their job in the way that they know best to do their job. That there are skills and capabilities that we hire them for and we empower them to do their work. And then the third is accountability. And this is to assume responsibility for work completion, growth and development and emergent needs. And so the reason we highlight these three pillars is because we know that when we look at things like employee activity, there are a lot of different ways to use this data. And the number one way to use this data effectively is to do so uh, in a way that supports your employees. And that means that when you collect those insights and you're transparent with those insights, that you are then responsible for taking action to ultimately improve the workplace. So what are our key takeaways for the audience before we move to Q&A here? Sure, when we think about those key takeaways, let's go through four of them, Julia. One is that the definition of productivity must change to incorporate both well-being and business outcomes. The measurement of productivity inputs must exist on an equal playing field with productivity outputs. So we no longer can measure productivity outputs so substantially differently then we measure productivity inputs. When we measure them differently, we make it very clear that we value them differently. And so in order to achieve sustainable productivity, we must make that shift to have adequate levels of measurement on both sides. The third is that we have to change the tone at the top and across the organization to address a sustainable productivity focus. And then finally, we have to make sure that when we are adopting new levels of measurement, we do so with a framework in place. We have to make sure that what we're measuring is done so in a way that establishes trust, empowerment, and accountability in our environment so that employers and employees can have an agreement that monitoring insights become, are becoming a key enabler to organizational performance and employee well-being. Terrific. Well, Gabrielle, Michael, and Melissa, we have a lot of questions for you. Thanks for the great presentation. And let's move right into the Q&A here. Uh, our first question here, most employers will know about turnover and hiring issues. How well do we know about the other three, burnout, engagement, and well-being? Do we even know how to track and measure that? Yeah, I'll, I'll start there. And I'm sure the others have a lot of things to say here. I would say the average company does not have a great capture on how to measure, you know, particularly burnout, right? So, you know, engagement, a lot of organizations tend to have something in place. And where it falls apart, I want to call back to a point that Gabriella made earlier that was really good, is actually acting on engagement data, right? There's a lot more measurement than, let's say, constructive action. 
Uh, but when it comes to things like burnout, and that's why you're seeing now things like organizations are hastily implementing things like stay interviews, right? To try and get a real time capture on that. But it, you know, it's, it's tricky because it, a colleague of mine always says, you know, don't ask a question you don't want the answer to. I think to date organizations haven't asked that question about burnout because they really don't know necessarily what to do with the answer and what is their roster of interventions, particularly when it comes to some of those kind of foundational changes in how we actually do work, where that could feel very, very disruptive. There's a second part of this question too here about, could it be that the definition or concept of well-being is not really clearly understood by the majority? And is this the reason that they, they wouldn't choose it as an answer? Um, and I think that's an important question here to talk about well-being and what does that mean? I'm going to kick in and say, I think that the definition of well-being is not going to be some transcendent issue that folks at MIT and Harvard or Mercer will, will all come to some sort of consensus on. I think the notion of what it means to borrow Melissa's language, being fed up or burnt out and well-being that's what organizational cultures are going to decide. That's why we talk about tone at the top and managerial concerns. What do we want well-being to mean in our organization? Once we have that definition, once we have that rough consensus, then measurement becomes more meaningful and actionable. So I think what you've identified, Julia, and what Melissa spent no, no small amount of time you know, defining is, the, the fact is, we don't have good definitions on this. Organizations haven't done the hard work, and what they're doing is they're firefighting. And that's why we do webinars like this. Hmm. So how do you do this ongoing measurement without being invasive or, or running the risk of being intrusive in terms of privacy issues? Um, question here, do you use natural language processing to understand what employees are writing or saying? Yeah, so I'll take that one. There are a lot of ways to do this. Uh, and so there are a couple ways to answer this question. One is a very technical answer, right? And I think for this discussion, I want to talk about more of the ethical answer to this. What are some of the ways that you can do this? And, and how, how can you do this in a way that's not disruptive to your culture, but in fact, in fact, elevates your culture? We've talked about a lot of those themes today, and I want to highlight them. The first is communication and making sure that you are able to explain to your company why are you why you are collecting this data. The second is empowering the employee, which means when you collect data like this, you can put it in the hands of your employees. So if we take one example of a, of a customer of ours that I love to highlight because they've done such a fantastic job at doing this, what they did is this is a, this is a customer of ours, a, a, a freight software company of over 5,000 employees that have been thoughtful about making sure that when they were collecting ongoing measurement, they, they created an, an ongoing uh, email subscription on a weekly basis so their employees could view their own personal insights. And so this level of employee empowerment led the employees to understand, oh, I can also see my data. And when I can see my own data, I can be thoughtful about how I start my days at different times of the day. And maybe, maybe that consistency would be more valuable for me if I were able to have more consistent behaviors. Or if I am most focused in the morning, how can I see when I'm having my focus time and how can I modify my meetings throughout the day to, to, to unlock that level of focus? Now, I know that I'm going into a bit of granularity here, but what I want to highlight is that a really effective way to collect activity data like this is to not only aggregate and anonymize that data at the top so that you can make systematic modifications to your workplace, but to also understand that the solution oftentimes sits with your employees. And you want to empower your employees to come up with a lot of those solutions. And so where I've seen this done effectively and where the software company was, was so effective at doing this was that they communicated the use of the data and then provided the data right in the hands of the employees so that there was an additional level of transparency there. Um, the, the final piece, which we have just been, you know, rightfully bringing up over and over and over again, and what the software company did as well, was that they took action. So they said, now that we've 
have the insight into this ongoing measurement and that we can see that our workplace behaviors are, are, are where we want them to be and we've devised solutions together, we can now you know, pull back from our, our in-office footprint and really shift to a remote environment. And that was something the employees really wanted, but the leadership team needed to feel more comfortable and rightfully so that that was a shift that they could make. But what the, what the leadership team did is that they delivered on that promise to their employees, which was we're going to use a mechanism like this to have the visibility that we need and the empowerment that you need so that when we have that, we can then take the action and provide you with that level of flexibility that you're looking for. Melissa, I want you to respond because you are such um, so demonstrative in your agreement here. Yeah, Tell I us. know, nodding, nodding enthusiastically because the, you know, the notion of giving people insights about themselves to fuel their own behavior change. I mean, think about it, right? That's why I wear a Fitbit. Right. I want to know things about me so I can do what I do better. And, you know, that's that's really powerful. And it's important to start with that. I think there's a lot of leading practice stuff in what Gabriella just talked through, but it's important to start with that level of, OK, how much insight can I give back to the person? And then once you get up to organizational level, I think you have, you have to do some work with the employee population to understand their preferences on how their data is shared. Because it's it's really interesting. When we do work with employee data. Sometimes people will say, I'm happy for HR to see it, but I don't want my manager to see it. Other organizations, other contexts, they'll say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy for my manager to see it, but please don't ever show it to HR, right? And so beyond the individual, the picture gets a lot more complex. And most folks are totally happy, by the way, to be part of aggregated big data sets, right? That if you can't see me, I'm happy for my insight to, to contribute, but I think the, the real sort of why I was nodding enthusiastically, the real starting point is that person being able to take action on their data and then everything else flows from there. I, I just want to second that and double down on the E word empowerment. And the one area that I would recommend for the audience to look for, for both inspiration and guidance is from bioethics, ethics and medicine, informed consent. What should inform consent around workplace data, monitoring data mean for your workforce? I think that if you give that to the lawyers, you're going to lose. If you give that to HR, you're going to lose. How do you create a healthy conversation around informed consent? Because consent without the information is deception. Information without consent is authoritarianism. How do you strike that balance? I hope people come away having a good argument about that. Well, here's a question that, that addresses those terms um, to a certain extent. Um, I've heard the term valuativity rather than productivity, uh, so we can measure outcomes rather than output. What are your thoughts on this and I how think, to go about it? I think they're working on a book. That's what I think. <laughs> Melissa, you gave an enthusiastic reaction to that yeah, one. I'll let you no, feel that. I do think I'm smiling because organizations really do have a problem sometimes segregating measuring activity versus measuring outcomes, right? And that's the, that's the holy grail. You know, it's it's actually worse in some ways to say, well, you know, activity just went up and people are just doing more if they're actually landing less in the way of in, impact and in terms of of outcomes. It's just it's a much harder conversation and particularly in certain disciplines i think sales is always a great example of this where there's a very set view about how activity ladders up to outcomes and it, it would be in certain contexts very disruptive to say well maybe it's not the number of customers you call per month right that it breaks certain long believed in value chains but i think that's the work that we have to be doing right now is kind of that difficult disruptive work yeah, I, it, it reminds me of one of the, the pieces that you touched upon earlier, Melissa, which is this piece around, you know, us having the opportunity to combine these data sets, right? And so if you're able to take employee activity and, and combine it with your functions view of outcomes, then you get into that conversation around uh, sustainable productivity, or in this case, valuativity, right? There's a lot of different, I don't want to get into a semantics conversation in, in the Q&A here. Uh, it is certainly a, a clever term 
that I think is very much in line with a lot of the principles that we're talking about today, which is how do you tie the activity to the positive outcomes that you want to see for your business? And so tying them together is where, where I think it's the same case for valuativity as it is sustainable productivity, as it is for healthy productivity. You'll hear these themes a lot and they'll be called different things, but the principle remains the same, which is if you don't look at the inputs and you only look at the outputs, you put sustainability and value at risk. Well, here's another question around definitions or terms or the way that we think about this now. Um, the words we use to refer to each other at work are also of importance in shaping our work environment. For example, managers and executives are employed workers, as are those we give the lower status label of employees. This conventional terminology in organizations is clear messaging about how different individuals are quite differently valued in most business organizations. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I oh, love the rethink on, on language in this context. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, sitting here and you know, make you see it out the window in New York City, where we just had a big debate about the term low skill workers. And frankly, I am all for this conversation because. To your point, how we talk about the role of different individuals within the organization and how we talk about different kinds of work has really fundamentally shaped our mentality about certain kinds of work. Um, and part of how we segment working populations as a, for instance, some of what we see as really innovative strategies um, in career pathing for blue collar workers are just doing what we've always done for white collar workers, right? So mm -hmm. breaking down some of those dichotomies, breaking down some of the kind of top-down, bottom-up language and trying to, you know, just talk about kind of different kinds of work, different kinds of workers in a more lateral way. I, I do think it's helpful to the conversation. I don't think it's sort of empty linguistic play. I, I agree that it's helpful. And, you know, I know organizations that have changed their vocabulary from employees to associates. Um, I really do believe, though, that the most important issue is you're gonna treat employees, associates, workers differently if you view them as a cost than as a resource. You're going to invest in them differently if you treat them as a cost versus a resource. You're going to measure them differently if you see them more as a cost than as a resource. And I would like people to come away from this webinar and from the principles that we've been articulating and discussing here, which is basically, you probably are going to have sustainable valuativity and productivity if you do a better job of measuring a balance between cost and resource. And, and you've got to commit to that. Uh, here's a question that uh, I think is, a, is an interesting one. I believe that very often companies only measure but don't have meaningful and sustainable follow-up follow up activities. Could you talk about that and what the implications are there for uh, employee well-being and attitude toward work? Sure, so I'll take the first step at this one, but I'll preface it by saying, Melissa, I'd love for you to talk about some of those strategies that, that you see and you employ. The number one issue at the at the start of this process is, is that you're asking employees to embark on a, on a new stage of a journey in which words are rede redefined and measurement is redefined. Now that requires your employees to, to have a level of trust, which is that you are adopting these new mechanisms to elevate their ability to perform in their role and to do so in a way that is healthy. And so, when you take that step of measurement and you leave it unmatched with a level of action or a level of support, then you diminish that trust. And so you, you've, you've, uh, you've put your culture at a level of risk that says you are going to provide a level of oversight, but not a level of insight. And so that is extremely detrimental to your environment. It should be avoided at all costs. Now, what we see a lot of our customers do and what we advise them to do is that if they're going to be progressive in their step towards ongoing measurement, uh, they need to make sure that they have a program in place to deliver on what they find in those insights. And so, Melissa, I'd love for you to sort of elaborate on that as, as the, the uh, real advisor here in terms of what you can do with those insights. 
Yeah, no, it's a it, it's a wonderful question, and I think what organizations don't understand, and you know, this is something that probably all of us on on this webinar grasp intuitively, is already by the time you've asked the questions, right? A measurement is an intervention, right? So you've already done you know, step one in their minds by asking the question. And then there's this unfinished process that sits in people's heads if you don't follow up. So it's not like, well, I can just kind of neglect this. It's something's already started in people's brains, the psychology of that, it's already going. And then what, you know, a good follow-up looks like, I think is, um, you know, a bit of kind of being really candid about what can be accomplished, right? And what can be accomplished now versus later. And also what results are possible. So talking about, you know, things like, okay, engagement was down, you know, this year in, in this population, right? Okay, here are the steps we're gonna take to address it. And then we're gonna see if that worked. That's the other piece that I think that makes for a successful program is not just, you know, sometimes organizations will come out and, okay, we got our, we understand our people, we got our people data and we're gonna do all these things. And then they don't see if the things worked. And it's that, loop back again, even before you take the next measurement, that's also part of making the program successful. One of, one of the greatest successes that I've seen is an organization that introduced Focus Friday in response to their organization that told them they were having a lot of trouble focusing. In two quarters, they looked back at their data and there wasn't an increase in focus on Friday. And so what that organization did is that leadership reported out in the all hands call that said, hey, this wasn't actually as effective as we thought. We're going to try a new strategy, which is focus blocks. And we're going to give you the discretion that you would like to have on establishing focus blocks. And we all need to be more thoughtful about how we respect one another's focus blocks. Now, what this did, which said it didn't work here's the new approach, is it doubled down on the trust with the employee base. It said, we measured, we tried, we failed, we tried again. And that is a piece that brings both leadership and employees together. And I, and I, I hear us because I don't think we have to eventually get away in bifurcating those groups so frequently. What it did is it brought the entire organization together that said, hey, we're, we're on this journey together and we're going to measure, react, modify, and continue. Well, we are just about out of time, but I want to ask one more question and ask each of you to weigh in maybe with a tweet size answer here, which is uh, we've had a lot of questions here that we didn't get to, but can you tell us for those that have listened in and in the last hour in the webinar, what's the single most important thing they can go back and take to their organizations from this webinar? What's the number one thing that will be helpful and useful in terms of the whole question of measuring productivity and healthy productivity and employee well-being? Gabrielle, let's start with you. Sure, I would say if you're measuring productivity by its historic metric today and you feel as if you're doing so in an effective way, then reconsider an adjustment in the metrics that you have and start measuring in, some, in a way that puts employees first. Melissa? Yeah, I would say kind of related to that, you know, really center in on, you know, an employee centric definition of what does it mean for an employee to be well versus not well? And then what is the relationship of that wellness to your business? And really, you know, kind of start connecting a lot of those threads uh, differently. Measure for actionable insight not better oversight. That's what happens when you go third. <laughs> <laughs> you get that tweet sized answer. Well, Gabriella, Melissa, and Michael, thank you so much. A really great presentation, very informative. So a final thank you to our sponsor, ActiveTrack. Uh, this is a timely and very important topic and we appreciate your insight all. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you. you. It's a pleasure.